The Church at large continues to say what it has said. It says what it has always said in the context of worship. And it reads its Bible faithfully. And yet, in so much of the life of the Church, there is a degree of loss of nerve, loss of confidence. Can we really understand God? Can we really expect people to absorb the doctrinal universe with its full and rich pattern that an earlier generation, or so we think, inhabited? But in among all this is also a problem which the present Pope has identified very shrewdly more than once. He's spoken sometimes of a loss of confidence in reason in our contemporary world. And I don't think that he means by that a loss of confidence in rational procedures so much as a loss of patience with argument, real mutual persuasion, a loss of the idea that by mutual persuasion and careful argument we might have our minds enlarged to receive more of the truth. So our intelligence is not in a very good way. It seems in or out of the church. And we've devised a number of quite successful ways of pretending there isn't a problem. Now, what St. John of the Cross says to us, and he's not just writing for Carmelite nuns in 16th century Spain, what St. John of the Cross has to say to us is that out of this sense of a brick wall before our intelligence, out of this sense of confusion and loss where our understanding is concerned, faith grows in its true meaning. It appears not as a system, not as a comprehensive answer to all our problems. It appears quite simply in the form of dependable relationship. You may not understand. You may not have the words on the tip of your tongue. But you learn somehow to be confident, or at least to be reliant on a presence, an other, who does not change or go away. You realize that when the signposts and landmarks have been taken away, there is a presence that does not let you go. And that's faith, I would say, in a very deeply biblical sense. Look at the disciples in the Gospels. Look at the number of times when they say something spectacularly stupid and Jesus says, don't even you understand. Look at the times when they ask the silly questions the times when they try to turn away, when they manifestly don't know what's going on. But in the great words at the end of John chapter 6, spoken by Peter, they also say, where else can we go? They know that the presence that has called them is dependable that while they may be insecure, volatile, easily capable of betrayal, forgetting and running away, what they confront in the one they call rabbi and master is one who will not go away. The loss of 
understanding, a clear sense of what we know and how we know, is part of the difficult business of learning to question at every level who we are. But as I'll say a bit more in a moment, explain a bit more in a moment, we are somehow set free to face all that and live with it by the conviction that we are not let go of. Faith as dependable relationship is something other than faith as a system of propositions, faith as confidence in my own capacity to master truth. It's much more a confidence that I can be mastered by truth, that I can be held even when I don't think I can hold on. And so in our age, and in the age that lies ahead, the faith we as Christians proclaim will need to be not a glib system, but the possibility of dependable relationship. We need to point quite simply to the God who does not let go, to the Christ who does not run away. And here's the rub. We need ourselves to be dependable people. We need to be people in dependable relationship. People who are there for those who feel abandoned, for those who don't know who and where they are. By our faithfulness to the lost, the suffering, the marginal, by our faithfulness, we begin to show what it is to have faith in the one who doesn't let go. And one of the biggest challenges to the church in our age is how we embody that kind of dependability in this society and throughout the world, which does require a bit of a shift in the kind of church we think we are given that we are most commonly perceived as people who are anxious who they should say no to. So there's the challenge. In the age of a dark night of the intelligence, we are being led, not for the first time, but led in a very definite, decisive way towards dependable relations. And we are to embody it and to offer it. But the dark night and the brick wall affect memory just as much. People sometimes speak about our social amnesia in this society. And once every six months or so, one or other of the newspapers will start again asking the question, what is Britain, or what is Britishness, and have we forgotten our history, and what's being taught in our schools? If the problem of intelligence is, what is truth? The problem before our memory is, have we forgotten who we were? Crises of identity are common now in society, not just individuals. What is it to be British? But what is it to be Western, Christian, modern? What is it to be Muslim or Jewish? Because the crises of identity are there as well. 